And this is in the, the new set of lecture note handouts. Okay, so we've finished the first set. We're on to the second set now, the second and the final set. So if you don't have it today, you'll get it for next week, okay? You'll survive by just following through today. Uh, you may want to take some notes. Um, you'll see in the lecture notes there are several topics that we do not cover. Uh, I think there was one before this on digital data communication techniques. Um, there's one after on multiplexing. These are topics that I've left in the lecture notes from usually from previous years, but I think we will not cover this year just because of time limitations. And in fact, we did not cover last year. So there may be some extra topics that you can browse through in your own time, but will not be assessed or covered in this course. We're moving now on to the second most bottom, the, the second layer from the bottom, the data link layer. Most of the things we've covered so far are about getting data bits, usually, across some link and as a signal. So we've looked at, and you looked at in your midterm exam, different ways for encoding our data as some signal and the trade-offs of those different techniques, uh, how do we measure performance and so on. That's about the physical layer. We're now going to spend the rest of the course rather quickly moving up through the remaining four layers, looking at main parts of each of them. And we're going to look now at data link control protocols, which is about the data link layer. And the main purpose of the data link layer is across that physical link, using the physical layer, it gets bits from A to B across one link. The data link layer provides some extra features, some extra services to make sure those bits are delivered correctly. And a few other things which we'll see. So it's still dealing with a link. Think of a cable connecting one computer to another. Physical layer gets the bits across there as a signal. Data link layer adds, adds some extra features to make sure that that data, that sequence of bits, is delivered correctly. And generally, we have protocols uh, that control the data transfer, data link control protocols. So what are some of the things that data link control protocols do? There's a, a set listed here. Frame synchronization, flow control, error control, addressing, control and data, link management. These are some of the features of data link layer protocols. Instead of dealing with just a sequence of bits, which is what the physical layer deals with, as we move up to the higher layers, we start to package those bits. And we talk about a, a set of bits, say, as a packet or a frame. So we usually group the bits together. In the data link layer, we often call it a frame. So we say we take a thousand bits, and that constitutes one frame. And we deal with on a frame-by-frame -frame basis, as opposed bit-by-bit -bit basis. Some of the issues that the data link layer has to deal with is how do we know what is the start of a frame and what is the end of a frame? How do we define a frame? How long is it? Uh, how does the receiver know where, when an old frame finishes and a new frame starts? Frame synchronization. We'll see some examples of frames, uh, at least visually, as we go through some protocols. Flow control is what we're going to cover in this topic. So we'll explain that in a moment, so in detail flow control. Addressing, when we send data from one computer to another, usually they have a hardware address, a MAC address is another name. So allocating addresses, defining the structure of addresses is part of the data link layer. Some of you when you use the internet, you know that you have an IP address, an internet address. But if you also look at the details of your mobile phone, your laptop, your PC, you'll see that there's an address associated with your LAN card or your wireless LAN card, a MAC address sometimes, or a hardware address. That address is part of the data link layer. So it's the data link layer that's responsible for making sure that the devices have correct addresses. Uh, another example 
often before we transfer data from A to B across a link, we set up that link. A says to B, I'm a, I want to transfer data to you, are you ready to receive data? And if B responds, yes, I'm ready to receive, and then they start the data transfer. So there's some concept of link management, setting up a link, making sure that link is maintained while we want to transfer that data. Error control. With the physical layer, we send a signal which represents bits across our link. There may be some errors because of interference, noise, the bits received may be different from the bits transmitted. They have bit errors at the receiver. So we want to deal with them. And one part of the data link layer is to perform error control, which is to first detect if the receiver has received something in error, detect errors, and then preferably also correct those errors. So if I transmit a sequence of bits 0, 1, 1, 0, and the receiver receives 0111, there's a bit error there, one thing to do would be to ask the sender to send again, to retransmit that data, uh, so that hopefully the second time it would be received without an error. And that's one form of error control. And we're going to discuss that in this topic as well. Error control uh, and flow control. Flow control we're going to go into today. Uh, we'll get uh, finished on part of it, and then we'll move on to error control after that. But there are other parts that we will not get to cover in this course about the data link layer. Flow control is rather simple, the concept. It's about making sure that the sender doesn't overflow the receiver. That is, the sender doesn't send the data too fast such that the receiver uh, memory or buffer overflows. So we're going to talk about that and we'll use this picture to, to show that. Uh, let's show an example. We need a volunteer. Okay. Let's see who wants to volunteer. Okay, thank you. Come up at the front as my receiver. I'm going to be the transmitter. I've got data to send to my receiver. Sorry? I've got one. I'll get you for the next volunteer. Just stand here. I'm going to send data to... So imagine I'm the transmitting computer. He's the receiving computer. I'm going to send some data to him. And you see the data... Instead of sending bits, we talk about a, a group of bits, say a frame or a packet. So my data in this case is a set of lids. They have a number on them. We'll see on the front there's a number, zero. You just wait. This is my data or a frame. So let's say inside here there are, say, a thousand bits. So my idea, my aim is to get all of this data to him. He's the receiver. He's going to process the data. Uh, whatever the data is, whether it's an image, he's going to combine the bits together and show the image on the screen. Uh, to demonstrate, I'm going to pass the, each frame to you, and the processing that you're going to do is when you receive one, you'll look on the front, look at the number, and write the number on the board. Okay, so get your pen ready. Let's get ready. In fact, the numbers, I'll just show him so it's a bit easier. Normally we'd expect the numbers to be in order, but uh, to make life simpler for, for me and the receiver, I'm just going to send them out of order. So look, when, I re when you receive, okay, when you receive, not yet, just look at the number on the front and write it down. Okay, not yet. You need to catch them. Okay. Ready? Okay. Come on. 
I overflowed the receiver in this case. So this is the concept of why we need, okay, time. I think you see what happened there is that I'm the transmitter. You can take a seat, thank you, well done. I'm the transmitter sending data to the receiver. The receiver receives the data, processes, and then receives the next data. But what happened is I sent the data too fast because he could only process what he received at some rate. It took him a few seconds to, to catch and write on the board. So that was the processing rate of the receiver. And because he was processing one frame of data, and I was transmitting the next one and the next one because I could transmit as fast as I like, and what happened eventually was that he was processing one and the next one arrived and he had no capability to receive that. He dropped that. I overflowed the receiver in that case. Now, in a computer, this overflowing at the receiver is because of the limited memory at the receiver. So, in, for the person, the reason he dropped some of the, the lids was because he had limited catching capability. He only had one hand to catch and to write, and he couldn't catch multiple at the same time. When the receiver, when we're sending data to a receiver, that receiver receives the data and puts it in memory. Sometimes we call it a buffer or a queue, but inside the computer memory. And because the computer memory is fixed, there's a limited amount of memory available, if we receive a lot of data, store it in memory, and it takes a long time to process that data, if the sender keeps sending data, once the memory is full and new data arrives, what happens? If there's no more space in memory to store the data, then something's going to be dropped. Not dropped on the floor, but in terms of if our memory is full and we receive new data, we cannot put it anywhere. We cannot put it in memory. So the receiver must discard that data. We don't receive the data, which is a problem. We'd like the receiver to be able to receive everything that's sent. So that's the, the concept of overflowing the receiver. Flow control is about making sure we don't overflow the receiver. Uh, let's see if we can implement it. All right, let's have another volunteer. I'm going to transmit again, and you're going to do the same thing. Receive, write down the number. And let's try and implement some flow control. In this case, when you receive one frame, you'll tell me when you're ready to receive the next one. Okay? All right, I won't throw, that's a bit mean. So normally I would just keep sending. Write the number down. Okay, he's ready for the next one, so I send. I've, I'm ready to send more, but I will not send more until he says he's ready to receive. Okay? And you see that this will work, in that he's all, the receiver is controlling how fast I send. Okay? And I think we'll see that if the receiver controls how fast I send, then I should not overflow the receiver. Okay, thank you. So flow control in a very simple manner is the receiver says when they're ready to receive more. Okay. Without flow control, what can happen is that the sender sends too fast, the receiver becomes overflowed and starts to lose data, starts to drop frames. With flow control, the receiver tells the sender, slow down or just send me at this slow rate so I can process and, and move forward. So we're going to look at two basic mechanisms for implementing this way for the receiver to tell the sender when to send. This diagram on the screen tries to show from the, this is the sender computer and this is the receiver computer. And looking at the details, just from the data link layer, typically receivers have some finite amount of memory to store the data they receive. So I've drawn that as this 
this, let's say, queue or buffer here. Let's say we have a memory of, of this receiver of 10,000 bytes, which means that once I've stored 10,000 bytes in memory, if I receive something else, I cannot put that anywhere and I'll lose that data. And what happens is that the source has some data to send. It transmits the first frame across the link and then we'll transmit the second frame as long as it has data to send. We'll keep transmitting frames containing the data across the link. And as the frames arrive, the receiver puts them in memory. So they receive them. They process them, say, right on the board. They do what they need to do with the data and pass it up to whoever's going to use it. If we look at a layered perspective, look, pass it up to the network. So that receiving, processing takes some time. Even for a computer, it may take, depending on the, the, the speed of the receiver, may take microseconds, milliseconds, depending on what's happening. So if we're sending fast here, and we're processing slowly, what happens is that more frames arrive than can be processed in some period of time, and they start to be put into memory in the buffer, and because the buffer has a limited size, eventually it becomes full. When it's full, this one's processing a frame, this buffer is full, the next frame arrives, well, what can happen? Something has to be discarded. That is, if the frame arrives, either it's, it's not stored in memory, it's dropped, or discarded, or maybe one of the ones already in memory is discarded. But the end result is some of that data is lost. It's not successfully received or passed up to the network layer and to the eventual destination application. So that's bad. We don't want to send data and have it not received. And hence we have flow control, which is as the receiver receives data, it sends back some feedback to the source saying, giving an indicator of how much more it can receive. So controlling how fast the source sends. We saw with a quick example that one way is that I send one data frame. When the receiver has processed that one data frame, he sends back some acknowledgement saying, thank you, I've received it, please send me another data frame. So we send that other data frame and then I cannot send a new one until he sends back an acknowledgement saying, thank you, please send another one. So that's a flow control protocol. It's the receiver controlling how fast the source sends. We'll go through that protocol in a bit more depth. So, in summary, receivers have a fixed amount of memory to receive the data. If we send too fast, we can overflow that memory losing data. That's bad. Therefore, flow control protocols allow the receiver to effectively inform the source how much more space it has available in the memory to receive new data so that's not overflowed. That's the concept, at least. Everyone's experts now. Okay, no problems. You understand what you did in the example. You understand how you will improve next time in receiving the data. What will you do? You dropped many, you dropped many packets. How would you improve that next time? Okay, you would tell me, thank you, I've received it now. Now I want the next one. Okay, that's the idea is that the receiver would say, thank you, I've received your data, I've processed it, now send me the next one. That's one way at least. So, flow control. Aim to ensure the sender does not overflow or overwhelm the receiver. If the sender sends too fast, then the buffer, the memory, at the receiver can overflow, it becomes full, and we cannot store anything else. The result is buffer overflow at the receiver. Data is lost. Data, losing data is bad because it becomes inefficient in the data transfer. 
So we possibly need to retransmit, and it, we'll see later if we need to retransmit, we'll reduce the performance of the, the system. So we want to avoid data loss. Hence, we implement some flow control mechanism which tries to prevent this buffer overflow, prevent any loss of data. And we're going to look at two mechanisms for implementing flow control. Uh, in, in the following slides, when we look at flow control, we're going to assume that when we transmit data across a link, there's no packet loss or there's no uh, data loss. That is, there's no noise or interference that cause the bits to be lost across the link, just to keep things simple. We'll see that maybe the delay may vary. We'll see the impact of that later. We're looking at the data link layer. Above the data link layer, we have the network layer and then the transport layer. It turns out that flow control mechanisms are also used in the transport layer, in particular in TCP. So even though we're talking about the data link layer, the same mechanisms are used in other protocols, and therefore they're very important to understand them. They have a large impact on the performance of internet applications. So let's today go through a flow control protocol, but to do that we need to introduce a new way to draw some pictures. I like to draw pictures to show how a protocol works. I'm going to first explain the, uh, the type of picture I'm going to, going to use. So the, these next two or three slides are about one technique to analyze and illustrate protocols. Not just flow control protocols, but others. First, remember that in a very simple link, if we have computer A connected to computer B via some cable, inside each computer we can break into the different layers. And the way we can think the data flows is that some user at computer A creates some data, an image, for example, that they want to send to computer B. The application passes that down to the transport layer and it's processed, maybe attach some header, and then we do that through all the layers. We do some processing on the data according to the protocol, pass it down, and eventually send the bits across the link. And as those bits are received, the opposite is performed at the receiver. We process, pass it up, and eventually the original data is passed up to the user at computer B. That's the data flow through the layered stack. Now, coming back to delay, how, how long does it take to get the data from A to B? Well, we've studied that in one of our first, le or first, our second topic of what are the four components of delay? Well, they're processing, queuing, transmission, and propagation. We can think that inside each layer, which are implemented inside our computers, there may be some processing delay and possibly some queuing delay. In this course, we don't have a way to calculate them. I usually give them to you. I say, okay, this computer has a processing delay of one microsecond. It's usually small because computers nowadays are fast to, to process a thousand bytes of data inside using the CPU and the memory. It doesn't take very long, but it takes a small amount of time. In some cases, there may be an additional queuing delay. So normally, we, we can think that there's processing and queuing delay in each of the layers. Transport layer processes, network layer processes, there may be some delay in each of them. So those delays are inside the computers, both the source and destination. The other two components of delay are transmission and propagation. Transmission, think of as how long does it take for the physical layer to send the bits onto the link? And we can calculate that. Remember, transmission, you did it in your midterm. We take the data size, the number of bits, divided by the data rate. Okay. So 1,000 bytes, is the, if that's the amount of data we need to send, and we're sending at 1 megabit per second, we can determine the transmission delay. That's the time to transmit the bits onto the link. 
propagation delays the time for one of those bits, or the signal representing one of those bits, to propagate across this link. And it depends upon the physical characteristics, the distance of the link in meters, and the speed at which the signal propagates, the speed of light, for example. So we can calculate them. The others usually are given to us, at least in this course. Add them all up, and we get the total delay from A to B. Now that's known. That's what you've, you know already. If we focus just on the data link layer, that is, let's see what happens at the data link layer. We receive data, we transmit to the physical layer, and then we receive here. We can break it into these, what, eight steps. We receive data from the higher layer, step one. We may have to queue the data. There may be some queuing delay. Maybe it's zero. Maybe it's uh, a, there's some delay there. We process the data. We do some processing. It takes some time. Then we transmit that data by sending it via the physical layer. Now, the data will call a frame in this case. So we say we transmit a frame. A frame is just a collection of, of bits. Instead of dealing just with individual bits, we group them together. So we transmit a frame of bits. That takes some time, that transmission time. It's the, the frame size divided by the data rate, the data rate of our link. That frame propagates across the link. It's arrived, it's processed by the receiver, it's possibly queued at the receiver, and then sent to the next higher layer. So from the perspective of the data link layer, those are eight steps there. Now, let's get to what we're aiming for. This is one way in which we commonly draw uh, diagrams to illustrate what's happening in a protocol and also to do some calculations. It's called a, uh, sometimes called a time sequence diagram or a message sequence diagram. It's a type of diagram to illustrate the, the operation of a protocol. Let's go through the parts. So here are the two computers, A and B. These vertical lines for A and for B will show on those lines things that happen at computer A and computer B. And because those things that happen at A and B take time, we'll illustrate time as increasing as we go down in this diagram. So if we say time starts at time zero, something takes some time, so time is increasing as we go down. What we'd like to do is illustrate the time it takes to get data from A to B, showing those four components, queuing, processing, transmission, and propagation delay. This example shows, I think, or it shows just two of those components, transmission and propagation. Let's say at this point in time, at computer A, data arrives from the network layer. That's step one. There may be some queuing delay, there may be some processing delay. In this example, this is just one example, I haven't drawn any queuing or processing delay. I've assumed they're small, zero, just for this example. We'll see later examples which are more complex. That is, the data arrives, and then we transmit that data. And the time to transmit that data depends upon the data size, the frame size, and the data rate. And to illustrate that it takes time to transmit this frame, I've drawn this rectangle here. Think of this rectangle meaning the frame of data. And it takes time, so I start transmitting, I'm transmitting, I'm transmitting over time, and then at this time I end transmitting. So these rectangles are used to illustrate a transmission of a frame. We can use it in both directions, we'll see later. As we transmit a signal from A through to B, it takes time to propagate. So if we think we start transmitting at this time, the signal starts propagating across our link. 
and I've drawn that propagation as this arrow, this line going from A to B. It starts propagating here, takes some time, and eventually arrives at B. The time it takes from when it leaves A to reach B is the propagation delay. So if we start transmitting at this time with some propagation delay, we receive that first bit of the frame at this time. We finish transmitting the last bit at this time at A. Again, that bit needs to propagate across the link. It takes time and eventually arrives at B. So from B's perspective, it starts receiving the frame here. It's receiving, receiving, and receives the last bit of the frame, and hence has received the frame in its entirety at this time processes the data and passes it up. So it delivers the data to the network frame. What we'll do is, in, in this topic and even in other topics, we commonly use these diagrams to show what's happening, the timing of sending the messages and receiving responses. And in fact, we'll also use them to calculate, to simplify the calculations of the total time it takes, the throughput, and the efficiency. So. This is just introducing the diagram structure and now we're going to look at flow control and we'll see how this is used. So we'll see some examples. In this example, the next slide, we can say the time from here to here is the transmission time and from here to here is the propagation time. Let's move on and look at flow control and see an example of this, this diagram. Back to our demo. First student, I threw the packets to, and I threw them too fast and he started to drop them. The second one, I sent a, a frame of data and the protocol was that when he received and processed that frame of data, he then sent back a response saying, I'm ready for a next one. And my step was, I send one, I don't send another one until I receive the response. This is a flow control protocol called stop and wait flow control. I transmit a frame, I stop and wait for a response before I transmit the next frame. So that's a very simple flow control pro protocol. We have two types of frames. I transmit a data frame to the receiver. I'm trying to send data to the receiver. The receiver sends back a different frame to me saying I'm ready for the next one. Sends back an acknowledgement frame or simply an ACK frame. So the data frame contains the information we're trying to deliver. The one that comes back, we'll call it an ACK frame or acknowledgement frame. There are other names. And that acknowledges the receipt of that data. And it tells me I'm allowed to send the next one. Remember, a protocol is just a set of rules that define what the entities do to communicate. So the rules in the stop and wait flow control protocol are uh, source transmits a data frame, then the source waits for an act frame before sending the next data frame. So I'm not allowed to send the next one until I receive an act. That's the rule. I cannot send two data frames at a, in a row. Must be send data, receive act. Then send the next data, receive the next act. That's the source. What does the destination do? When a destination receives a data frame, it processes that data. It's not shown here, but it processes that data. And when it's ready to receive more, it replies with an act. So the destination receives the data, looks at it, processes it, done with the data, and now sends back an act saying, I'm ready to receive more data. And if the destination is busy, 
So the destination has received some data, is taking a long time to process it, then to make sure that the source doesn't send any more, simply don't send an app, delay the sending of an app. So that's the flow control mechanism. Because the source is not allowed to send more data until it receives an app, the destination controls the speed at which the source sends by controlling when it sends an app, an acknowledgement. The normal result is what we get is send data, app comes back, send the next piece of data, and app comes back, and we just keep going like that. If everything works fine, data app, data app, and so on. So that's the stop and wait flow control protocol. It's illustrated as an example in this diagram. And I've taken, well, let's say we have a lot of data to send from A to B. And instead of sending it all in one frame, we divide that data into multiple frames. We'll discuss later why we'd do that and the advantages and disadvantages, but let's say, for example, I have a, a million bytes of data to send from A to B. So what I do is I send a thousand bytes at a time. Each frame contains a thousand bytes of data. So frame one, the first 1,000 bytes, arrives from the higher layer. I have a thousand bytes to send. I put it inside a frame. Computer A transmits that frame to B. The time it takes to transmit is shown by this rectangle. So it takes some time. We start transmitting, we finish tr transmitting. And the signal takes time to propagate across the link. The time in which the receiver, <coughs> receiver B has received that frame as it is at this time here, at the end of the arrow. Because we need to transmit the entire frame and B needs to receive the entire frame. So it depends upon the transmission time and the propagation time. B receives the frame and now processes that frame. It takes time to process. It may not be ready to receive more. In this, in this example, I said B receives the frame. It's processing. It's got it stored in the buffer, in the memory. There's no more space to receive a new one yet. So it doesn't send an act yet. It waits until the data has been processed and delivered to the higher layer, and now there's more space in the buffer to receive the next frame. And if we're allowed to receive the next frame, what we do is we tell computer A by sending an act, an acknowledgement frame. So it takes time to transmit this act frame. It's of some size. It takes time to propagate back to A. And at that time, A has received the act, and A now knows it's allowed to send the next data. Now coming back to what happened to A. It had data, data 1, to send at the start. It transmits in the first frame. And after transmitting that frame, A has no more data to send, so it does nothing. It's just waiting. It's waiting, it's waiting. But then some more data arise from its higher layer, ready to be sent to B. That is data 2, the second 1,000 bytes arrive. And a needs to send this second piece of data to B. But at this point in time, it's not allowed to. Although it's got data to send to B, A is not doing anything. It transmitted a frame, now it's just doing nothing. It's not allowed to send the second frame because it hasn't yet received an act for the previous frame. When it does receive the next act, then it can send the second frame containing this data. And that's data frame 2 is transmitted. Takes some time to transmit, to propagate to B. In this example I say that B receives the data and immediately processes it and immediately sends back an act saying I'm ready for the next one. So it sends back an act. 
coming back to A, we transmitted the data frame containing data 2. We're waiting for an act. We're not doing anything. We don't have any more data to send yet. We receive the act, which allows us to send more data. If we've sent one data frame, we receive the act. That means, yes, you can send the next one. But since we don't have any more data to send, we don't send anything. But then if we have more data to send, of course, we can send data frame 3, and the diagram doesn't show it, but we'd propagate. Eventually, we'd receive an act back, and then we could move on to the next data frame. And if we had a thousand byte, uh, a thousand chunks of data to send, if everything worked well, we'd see this pattern of data, act, data, act, data, act, and continue until all the data is delivered. The receiver should never be overflowed in this case so long as the receiver has space to receive one frame. Because the receiver B only ever receives one frame at a time. Receives the first frame, puts it into memory. Once it's processed and removed from memory, it sends an act saying, I'm ready for the next one. And sends, when B receives the next frame, it stores that in memory. Once it processes that data, it deletes it from memory and making space available in the memory and sends back an act saying I'm ready for the next one. So there's no chance for A to overflow the receiver in this case, which is the aim of our flow control protocol. Any questions on how this works? Stop and wait. Concepts are simple. Some of the, the technical details may be new to you. Uh, we'll go through another example soon, but any questions on the protocol rules? Send a data frame, wait for an act before you can send the next one. And the receiver when we've received a data frame, process it, and when you're ready for the next one, send an act. And we get this. The source sends, it stops and waits, and then it sends, and it stops and waits, and then sends and continues to do that as we have data. So if you understand the the rules for stop and wait, then you can answer this question. Try. And the way to answer it is to use your basic knowledge of transmission and propagation delay and draw a diagram that illustrates the exchange of these three messages. So in this simple case, the source has three 1,000 byte messages to be sent. It has them all ready to send to B. 3,000 bytes to send. Uh, we'll come back to the processing. When we send the data, so we have 3,000 bytes of data, when we send it in a frame, in our data frame, we put 1,000 bytes at a time in each frame. So one frame contains 1,000 bytes of data. A frame also contains a header. Most protocols add, add a header to include extra information to support the protocol. I'm just making up some numbers for this question. I say that the data frame contains a thousand bytes of data plus a 20 byte header. So the frame is in fact 1,020 bytes in length. An act frame contains no data, it just contains the header. In this case, the ACK frame is 20 bytes in length. So we know the size of the two frames. We have some information about the link, 2 kilometers, data rate of 1 megabit per second, velocity, so instead of the speed of light, to keep things simple, 2 by 10 to the 8 meters per second. So you can calculate propagation delay. You can calculate frame transmission delay. I 
tell you that there's a processing delay at the destination of one microsecond. There's no other processing or queuing delays, to keep things simple. Before you answer what is a throughput, now try and draw a diagram which is similar to this, which is easy, but now try to start to put numbers to the time. That is, assume we start at time zero, so this would be time zero here. If you know how long it takes to transmit the data frame, if we start at time zero, then the time here would be the transmission time. And the time at this time, this point would be the transmission time plus the propagation time. And try and label this diagram with the times at each of these steps. What is this time? What is this time? And so on. And by doing that, we can t help you to calculate the total time, and then we'll use that to calculate the throughput. So the idea is to draw this diagram, but put numbers on it as well, showing the time to do each step. To put those numbers on it, you need to know or do some calculations first. So calculate the propagation and transmission delay. First thing you can calculate is the transmission delay of the data. If you know the data size, you know the data rate, you can calculate the transmission delay. We'll need that later. I haven't shown the units, but our data frame, well, the data frame contains a thousand bytes of data plus 20 bytes of header. So we have 1,020 bytes in total. We send that at a data rate of 1 megabit per second. So the transmission delay is simply the data size divided by the data rate. I note that is trans, transmission, and lowercase d for the uh, subscript d for the data frame. What's the answer? A thousand and twenty bytes times by eight is eight thousand one hundred and sixty bits divided by one megabit per second. Eight one six zero microseconds. You can use other prefix, you can use millisecond seconds, but I will use microseconds just to keep things consistent and, and simple. So the transmission delay of one data frame containing a thousand bytes of data is 8,160 microseconds. In the following, in what I write here, I may not give time units. If I don't give time units, then assume it's in microseconds. So I'll keep everything in microseconds so that it's easier to add them up later. Similar, we'll, we'll also need to know the transmission delay of the act frame. The 
transmission delay of the AC. The AC is simply 20 bytes. So do the same approach, the same data rate, you'll get it's 160 microseconds. So that's, that's basic calculations. The other thing that we'll need is the propagation delay. And if you look at the question, we'll see that the propagation delay is the same in both directions. Because the link is the same distance and we have the same transmission speed in both directions. We had, what, 2,000 two thousand meters, is that right? Two kilometers? And we had two by ten to the eight meters per second. And that equals ten microseconds. This one hundred and sixty was also microseconds. We need those numbers when we go through and look at other all the time steps. So the stuff that you did early uh, in the semester. Transmission and propagation delay. Transmission of the data frame, 8160 microseconds. Transmission delay of the ACK frame, 160 microseconds. Propagation delay in both directions, so in one direction, 10 microseconds. In the other direction, also 10 microseconds. Now, now start drawing this diagram for the, our scenario, but label the time. So think if you have a clock. The clock starts at zero. So this point here is time zero. Then what is this point on our clock? Well, if we start at time zero, this illustrates, the rectangle illustrates the transmission time of a data frame. If we start at time zero, this point would be 8160 microseconds because it takes 8160 microseconds to transmit that frame. So what you should do is label here 8160. And I suggest you keep everything in microseconds. It will be easier. Uh, so 0, 8160. And then, well, what is this time? If we finish transmitting at time 8160, at what time has the entire frame arrived at B? Well, you need to take into account the propagation delay and try and follow through the diagram labelling the time, the clock value. Try and draw the diagram yourself uh, to get started. And I always say include units, okay? Make sure you include units in your answers. For simplicity on these diagrams, as long as you define the units, you may omit them to keep it a bit simpler. In my case, I suggest, well, in my case, I'll use microseconds. I suggest you do the same. So you don't have to write microseconds all the time, just use the number. So now start drawing the diagram and label 0, 8160. What is this time? And then find, now, now label from the perspective of a clock. If this is time 0, what is this time? It would be, this rectangle represents the transmission time. Okay, now keep going. Good. Okay. On the right track. Let's start drawing.
give you a hint what, what I'm suggesting to do to, to help in the final calculation. So A, this is our time sequence diagram, A and B. The rectangle I draw here illustrates the transmission of a frame, which takes some time. So, and the green numbers indicate the clock value. Let's say our clock starts at zero, we start timing. Everything starts at time zero. We start transmitting the data frame. How long does it take? Well, graphically it's shown as this, this time. Start transmitting here, finish transmitting here. Therefore, if we start our clock at zero, this time point is 8160 microseconds because we calculated before the transmission delay to be 8160. Now, while we're transmitting that, in fact, the bits are propagating across the link. So you need to determine when does that data frame start to arrive and finally completely arrive at B. So keep drawing the diagram and, and label the clock value to see the timing. Now, you don't have to draw it to this level of detail. We'll, we'll say that we can simplify it in a moment. But to show the detail, remember we start transmitting the frame here. The frame is made up of a se sequence of bits. In our case, we have 8,160 bits. What you can think of is we transmit one bit at a frame, uh, one bit at a time, okay? where we're sending at a rate of one million bits per second. So A transmits the first bit, it comes out of the computer, goes across the link, starts to go across the link. Then transmit the second bit, the third bit, and transmits all the bits out of the computer. When it's finished transmitting the frame, we're at time 8160. So this illustrates the transmission time. Now, the other thing is that as we, each bit comes out of the computer, the signal needs to propagate across the link. And that takes time, the propagation time. And the way I've illustrated it here is that if I transmit the first bit at time zero, the first bit comes out of my computer at time zero, then it takes 10 microseconds to propagate across the link from A to B, Therefore, that first bit will arrive at B at time 10 on our clock. The second bit will arrive a little bit later, and the third bit after that, because we transmitted them one at a time, they arrive one at a time at the destination B. If I transmit that last bit at time 8160, it takes 10 microseconds to propagate across the link, that last bit arrives at time 8170 at B, 10 microseconds later. So from B's perspective, it starts receiving the frame at time 10, and it's received the frame in its entirety at time 8170. It's received it in full. And we mainly care about when we receive it in full, because only then can we process that data. What does B do next? Before it transmits the act. It's received, B has received the data. At this point in time, I've just received the frame. 
And in the question, we see the destination takes one microsecond to process. I add a, a little bit more. It takes some time to process. That is, we receive the frame, put it in memory, process the frame. When we're finished processing, we remove it from memory and then send the act. So we don't send the act immediately. We have a small processing delay and then send the act. You'll see my diagram won't be to scale, uh, but we'll try and capture most things. I don't have space to draw all the uh, components or to draw it to scale, but let's see what happened. B received the first bit of the frame at time 10, received the last bit at time 8170. That's here. It's now received the entire frame. What it does now is it processes that frame. And in the question, we said the processing time takes one microsecond. So, although I haven't written it, if this was time 8170 on our clock, this time here, when we finish the processing, would be 8171 plus 1. 8171. Once we've finished processing, we're ready for the next one, the next data. And to indicate to A we're ready, we send back an act an acknowledgement frame. And I've drawn the ACK frame here. If we start transmitting the ACK frame at 8171, we calculated before the transmission delay of the ACK frame was 160, therefore we'd finish transmitting the ACK frame at 8171 plus 160 is 8331. That's when we've finished transmitting the ACK frame. The same as the data frame, the ACK has to propagate. So the first bit arrives and eventually the entire ACK arrives. At what time? Well, it's quite simple. If we finish transmitting at 8331 and it takes 10 to propagate, it will arrive at 8341. Keeping track of this clock as we go is going to be useful in term determining the total time and then the throughput. We've got three more, two more packets to send. We'll see they're similar to the first case. But any questions on this first data frame? How I come up with those numbers? Remember, we're using stop and wait flow control, send the data, stop and wait for an act to come back. So A sends the first data frame. The question said that we have 3,000 bytes to send. The first frame contains just 1,000 bytes. So we have 2,000 left to send. But A is not allowed to send the next data frame until it receives the act back. And what B does, receives the data, when it receives data, processes, removes from memory, 
makes space available in the buffer to receive more, and sends an act saying, I'm ready to receive one more. Send the act back. And when A receives the act in its entirety, A knows B has received the data, B is ready for more, so A sends more. A transmits another data frame. And you continue through for the timing. And the hint is, it will look exactly the same as here, because nothing changes in the next data frame. Every uh, data frame, propagate, process, act, propagate back. But we keep adding on to our clock. See if you can do that. We have three data frames. We had 3,000 bytes, so it's in fact this repeated two more times. Find the total time down the bottom. The, the time when we finish. So 8341, we're allowed to send the next data frame. So let's send it and follow through the steps. The data frame takes time to transmit. The last bit will arrive at this point in time. Then we'll process, so there'll be a small delay here. And then we are ready to send the act back. And the act needs to propagate back. And we'll arrive at this time. And you can determine the number, or the, the clock in each of these points. We start at 8341, plus the transmission time, plus the 10 to propagate, plus the one to process, 160 for the act to be transmitted, plus 10 to come back. And you will arrive at the time here. Anyone have the value? 16, 682 sounds right. I'll write them down in a moment. I'll finish my picture. And then when the act comes back, A will be able to send the next data frame. And we'll get the same steps. And if you go through those calculations and add up the time, you should see at this point the finishing the second frame is 16682 and then we go through again data propagate process act propagate and I've calculated before anyone get an answer 25, 0, 25, 0, 0, 1, 3, 0, 1, uh, 0, 2, 3. I think you'll find the last time is 25. Zero, two, three. You can draw it better than me, and you should label, okay, data act, so you know what these things mean. And in fact, you should 
just to be sure, label the clock values at each of the points. It's just adding on numbers. And you should arrive at that final time of 25023. And if you look closely, you'll see the second two instance, uh, or the packet, or frame two and frame three, we had three data frames, we get exactly the same as frame one. The fr frames are the same size, propagation delay is the same. So in this example, the time from, if we look, for the first data frame, data, propagation, processing, act, propagation, took 8341 microseconds, from 0 to 8341. And in fact, in the second data frame, between this time and here, is also 8341 because everything's the same. And in the third one from here to here is also 8341. For each data frame, to get the data frame there and the act back, it takes 8341 microseconds. And you'll see that the final answer, this 25023, is simply three times. 8341. Of course, my, my diagram is not to scale. The processing delay is much smaller relative to the other examples. Now, the, the the reason for including the clock value in this diagram is it will give us, it would help us calculate the throughput because now we know the total time to, to deliver the data. Let's say we had not three frames but three million frames of data to send. Everything, everything the same. And I ask you to keep drawing it for 3 million frames. Then you need to calculate what's the time at the end. Well again you'll see that, okay, for the first frame it takes 8341, each subsequent frame is exactly the same, another 8341 microseconds, because it's the same, uh, same link, same data size. So the total time, you wouldn't draw it of course, but you could calculate the total time it's just 8341 for each frame. So if we have 3 million, it's 3 million times 8341. So you can extend it to any number of data frames. Now the question, and what we're trying to arrive at, is the throughput. How fast is the receiver receiving real data? And from the receiver's perspective, how often do we receive a data frame? From B's perspective, how often, if we continue this for three, for 300, 3 million frames, what could we say about the rate at which we receive data frames? How often do we receive a data frame from B's perspective? Every something microseconds. That's what I'm looking for. How often, if we look not just at the first one, but the second one and the third one, and even if we had others, how often does B receive a data frame? No. Uh, we 
let's see if we can show see it on the diagram. B started receiving the first one at this time. It started receiving the frame. And then it started receiving the second frame, although it's not clear on the diagram, but around here. That is, at this time, we, B started to receive frame one. Received the entire frame one. And then if we followed frame two, it would start to receive at this time. Because the frame is transmitted here, arrives here. And similar, it would start to receive frame three at this time. And if we had more frames, I don't have it on the diagram, the fourth frame, if there was one, we would check it's about here. If we look and see the pattern from B's perspective, it's receiving a frame, it receives a frame, then it waits, sends an act, and then receives the next frame, and continues doing that. We can say that it receives one frame in every period of, or every time of this duration. What is this duration? You can go back and calculate, but you'll see, well, it's the same as the time it takes to deliver one frame. It's 8341 microseconds. B is receiving a data frame every 8341 microseconds. And you can check that by doing the calculations, I won't. In 8341 microseconds, it receives the first frame, plus there's the time of waiting and sending back an act. And in the next 8341 microseconds, it receives another frame. And then in the next 8341 microseconds, another frame. And if we had continuous data frames to send, it would keep going. We're almost out of or out of time, but let's finish this. Uh, the end result for our throughput. If we're receiving one data frame, one data frame every. What have we got eight three four one microseconds. One data frame contains a thousand bytes of real data plus 20 bytes of header. So we're receiving a thousand bytes of real data every 8341 microseconds. That's the rate at which we receive real data, which is the throughput by definition. And the calculation turns out to be around uh, well, 959118 bits per second. You can check that. That is the throughput using this protocol. It's the rate at which we receive the real data, one data frame every 8341 microseconds, each data frame contains a thousand bytes of data plus 20 bytes of header. And therefore, if we divide them, we get around 959 kilobits per second. We had a one megabit per second or one million bit per second data rate. The throughput is 959,118 bits per second. Less, slightly less than the data rate. Out of time for today. Check those calculations for yourself. Make sure you can determine those numbers, the total time that I come up with, 25023, and make sure you can calculate the throughput. Okay, I went through that quickly at the end. Check and see, see if you do consider it. The, the throughput is the rate at which we receive the real data. 
this contains the ack. Look, the, the hardest thing here, and maybe we'll have to go through uh, next week again, but see if you can work out why is it 8341 here? Think about maybe keep drawing more packets and look at the pattern, the rate at which B receives data, and see why it's 8341. If you can get through that concept, I think you'll be clear on this uh, and it can apply this to other situations. The 8341 is the time to receive the frame, process, transmit the act, and then wait for the next frame to arrive. Let's stop there and next week we'll look at some variations of this example and then look at a, a better or a, a different flow control protocol. Is there a quiz this week? Good question. I haven't created one yet. I'll think about it. Uh,